Okay, here we are on part two of Roasting Foundation. Last time we talked about the historical developments of the coffee roaster, and that brings us to our picture today, which is kind of a generic uh, but very useful and common picture of a drum roaster with an afterburner attached on the left. And uh, while the knowledge that was shared, the information from the history, isn't critical for your exam, uh, it is very helpful to start with a baseline for understanding where we got to go today. So these areas and controls are required for your knowledge on the written exam of the roaster apparatus and machine here. So as we uh, look at the many variations in different burners or drums or controls, there may be different ways that you'll notice cooling and exhaust on machines that you encounter or work with. But basically the main components and functions are universally applied according to different brands and size of roasters. Okay, so let's start with the hopper. The hopper, that triangular shape there. So the hopper is where you're going to put the green coffee and uh, while the, while the uh, coffee roaster is coming to the target temperature to charge the beans, now we'll wait and release those green coffee when we reach that temperature. Okay, so the coffee will enter into the roast drum and there will be hot air moving. The roast drum will be heated by the burners below, uh, different types of burners, atmospheric burners, infrared burners, electric burners. And um, there should be on the outside here some sort of an air temperature indicator, right? So we're able to read the temperature before we charge the beans. Um, we're also able to read the temperature while we are roasting the coffee and that may include a bean thermometer probe, a temperature probe, and a computer readout or a computer screen. But this is a more traditional uh, diagram. Then up above here the hot air exhaust out, right, so the air may flow and depending on our hot air exhaust damper, how far open or closed we have that will allow for more or less hot air to escape from the roaster. In the different phases in the roast cycle, we actually change the amount of air we let uh, recirculate within the roaster or circulate out and go into exhaust. So while uh, roasting and uh, when the roast is finished, right, we'll eventually release the coffee down into the cooling tray and there's cool air that's produced by some sort of a fan and this will be a suction so it'll be pulling air uh, from above down through the coffee bed and then uh, it will exit out of the machine as well um, through the exhaust. Okay so let's go up above here and when the hot air is coming out of the roaster, okay so this exhaust out, it should have some kind of a pipe. It may be piped directly depending on your location or machine and it may also be piped into an afterburner. Now the afterburner includes a chaff cycl cyclone area and a fume incinerator to ensure safety and clean up the chaff, clean the air, clean the smoke, and the chaff will be collected down below which should be emptied. That's part of a daily cleaning maintenance. And then the hot air will escape out of a chimney. Now we especially want to emphasize here that there are many safety considerations included in a roaster's job. Some of these may uh, include um, and they emphasize the importance of good training. It's easily it's easy to get burned from hot surfaces. Many of these surfaces will be very hot, 200 plus degrees Celsius, 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, the the roaster may be exposed to uh, smoke or fumes, various levels of that, and various time exposure. Handling very heavy or large amounts of green coffee, operating gas-fired equipment. Uh, that definitely requires a great knowledge and attention to safety and detail. There may be packaging equipment, sharp objects, large boxes used in production. Depending on the size of the operation, you may have a green coffee storage area with stacked bags and forklifts. Okay, excessive uh, exposure to dust particles. So uh, the roaster's job is not one to be taken lightly. And where, where do we find the roaster in this coffee journey? Okay, these 10 steps. We find the roaster highly involved in all areas. And so typically right there at six, seven, eight, uh, the roaster is going to spend most of their time, right, um, selecting green coffee and uh, cupping and sampling it and then roasting according to parameters. 
But a lot of that understanding, and depending on the size of the operation, the roaster may be involved in bean selection, understanding farms, uh, sampling from farms, even traveling to farms, and really uh, calibrating what the farmers have achieved and what the processors have achieved um, and bringing that into the roastery. Why? Because the roaster is also looking forward. They're looking at the consumer demands. They want to understand what the consumer preferences are and roast according to uh, those standards, especially if you have large wholesale accounts. You got to make sure your espressos and coffees are exactly as your customers need them. And if you're selling directly to uh, consumers, you need to be able to communicate. Sometimes you have to offer training or classes. So the roaster is a critical uh, player in this vast coffee process. One of the things, just for noting on the exam, is that the coffer, the roaster needs to understand that coffee, uh, green coffee, to be qualified as specialty, uh, should be within a target total moisture content of 12%. So often, as we said before, that'll involve selecting coffees and sampling green coffees, checking their moisture level. Um, and, and then in storage, making sure that those moisture levels are maintained by proper humidity and temperature uh, environment control. Okay, so we're going to look at taste and flavors, how they develop the aromas and acids and body and bitterness, and how it correlates to roast levels. Much of this is a relationship, okay, so it's kind of a logical framework that we can build on whether or not it's a direct relationship or an indirect relationship. If something goes up, what goes up? If something goes up, what comes down? So as we roast coffee longer, we can say time is increasing. What happens to acidity? It decreases. So we roast coffee longer, acidity diminishes. What happens to sweetness? As we roast coffee longer, sweetness increases. Sugars increase. What happens to bitterness? As we roast coffee longer, bitterness increases. And this is all throughout the roasting process. Now, you might argue, you might say, well, very, very dark roasted coffee is extremely bitter. It's not sweet. And while that's true, uh, the sugars and sweetness have continued to increase. However, the bitterness has increased at an exponential rate and has overcome any of the gains in perceived sweetness. And so uh, we're looking here at the uh, sugar contents, the sugar development. Uh, while acidity has diminished, sweetness has increased, but bitterness has increased faster. And also, um, color change, it's going to get darker, right? Uh, how much darker? Well, uh, depending on how dark you want to roast it, you could dark it to a black charcoal. Uh, size change. How much will it change? Light roasted coffee may increase from green to uh, light roasted coffee may increase 50% in size, whereas a dark roasted coffee may double in size, increase 100%. So how does the weight of the coffee change? There's a weight loss. If you put in one kilogram of coffee, uh, you pull it out, Depending on the roast, if it's a lighter roast, it may lose 150 grams. It may go from 1,000 grams to 850 grams. And if it's a dark roast, you may lose 20%. So you may start with one kilogram of coffee and end up with 800 grams of roasted coffee. How much would you roast, uh, or how would you want to roast that coffee if you wanted to maximize your acidity? Yeah, you'd roast it lighter. What would you do if you wanted to maximize bitterness or extraction rate? you would roast it darker. Okay, so extraction rate and body are also going to increase over time, and that's because the coffee is becoming more, uh, more brittle. It's easier to extract. It's easier to get those compounds to absorb into the water. Now aromas will change. Um, you know, they'll become uh, different enzymatic and caramelized brown sugars, and then dry distillation will move through that flavor wheel. Uh, as we go through the coffee roasting cycle as well. Okay, let's talk about heat transfer. Now, basic physics are required uh, at this level, and we'll get intermediate and, and advanced, really, in the next courses as well. But um, we'll talk about endothermic and exothermic heat. Now, endothermic is just like the word in or inward, E-N, um, 
there is heat coming in to the green coffee. It's absorbing heat. And then something happens at first crack where the beans actually begin to give out that heat. Okay, so we'll, we'll expand that a little bit more later. But during the first phase, this endothermic phase, the beans are absorbing heat from the drum, from the hot air. And uh, what's going to happen is the moisture inside the drum is going to be constantly increasing. And as that moisture increases, what you're going to start to recognize, if you've ever smelled roasting coffee in the first phase there, the endothermic phase, is this wet hay or this bread kind of a smell. And um, that's right then when the colors are starting to change as well. That green to yellow change is when moisture is extremely high, right before first crack. So uh, speaking of endothermic and exothermic, a coffee roast master should really understand how these various types of heat transfer are at work in coffee roasting. Okay, so we've got different ways to transfer that heat and whether it's going into the beans or coming out of the beans. So the first one we'll talk about is convection. Okay, so uh, this is where uh, heat is transferred by, in our picture here, we've got water moving around in the pot. Okay, so in our coffee, we've also got water molecules within the coffee. We've got moisture moving around inside the drum. We've got airflow around the beans that's transferring heat. Okay, so this is a moving kind of a heat that is transferring and circulating. The beans are also rotating amongst each other, and so those that have recently been near the bean wall are hotter, and they're rotating into the beans on the inside of the drum, which may be a little cooler. And um, then later, when we release the beans into the cooling tray, that introduction of cool air is also going to be a convection sort of cooling. Okay. Um, now, the second form of heat that you should recognize, and these first two, convection and conduction, are the most important in our roasting process. So how does conduction heat contribute to roasting? Now, this is the direct touch of a hot surface. You see the, the man pulls the pot from the pan or from the fire. He's going to burn his hand on the handle. So this is just like the direct heat where coffee beans touch the hot wall of a preheated drum. So upon entry, or even, um, or, or even if, the bean, or if the drum is roasting too slowly, those beans are going to be heated up significantly by contact with the bean wall. And then later, when the beans exit the chamber uh, into the cooling tray, that cooling tray is going to be cool. And so immediately, you're going to feel those beans are going to react in a cooling method as they touch a cool metal cooling tray. The third way, which isn't quite as critical uh, in the roasting process, although it is important, is radiation. So this is heat emitted, um, and especially, I guess, uh, if you've got an infrared burner down below. So that heat is going to transfer from a hot burner up to that uh, roasting drum. Okay, so like a Diedrich infrared burner. And um, you'll notice that fire is not directly touching the beans. So whether there's uh, atmospheric heating, you know, uh, the fire is... Uh, the fire is heating the drum or an infrared burner is heating the drum. It's always heating the drum. It's not directly being applied to the beans. And then we've got heat from above the drum and surrounding. We've got external factors. So if you're roasting in the summer, if you're roasting in the winter, okay, that radiant heat radiating around the uh, roaster will also cause a change in your roasting, especially if it's the first batch or if it's the sixth batch that you've been roasting. Now, it's important to understand how we can mitigate negative heat exchanges. So, for example, scalding the beans with an overly hot preheated drum. When you drop those into a drum, you want them to be able to, uh, you want them to be able to have airflow that's proper. You don't want to stall the roast in later stages of development because you haven't controlled your heat properly. And then, while it's not taught at the foundation level, these skills should be observed and acquired. You should pay attention to them as you move in your roasting coffee career. It's also important here to note why proper drum rotation and speed, not to mention avoiding an overly full drum, is necessary, because it reduces the amount of time that beans are in contact with the drum surface so as not to scorch them. 
All right, so that wraps up heat transfer for here. Next, we're going to move on to stages of the roast in part three.